Hey everyone, this video is about anorectal anatomy. I think getting a really good grasp on this anatomy can help us understand both the pathophysiology and management of a lot of benign and malignant anorectal disease. So to start, we'll think of uh, essentially a coronal or an AP view of the anal canal and the rectum. I'm just gonna draw this here. So down here, this would be like the perianal skin. Uh, then up here, kind of running off the screen, we'll have the rectum. So to systematically work from bottom to top, we're going to talk about all these different spaces you might have heard about or uh, locations like the margin, the verge, the canal, the rectum, etc. So to start all the way down here at the bottom, this kind of marginal area around the anus itself is called the anal margin, as you might guess. So it's five centimeters radially uh, all around the anus. And then right here, we have this edge or ridge that's called the anal verge, and that marks the transition between this external anal margin uh, into the anal canal itself. And then when we're talking about the anal canal, that extends roughly another five centimeters above the anal verge, and that's really demarcated by the anal sphincter complex. Remember that that's made up of two main muscles. You have the internal anal sphincter right here, which is just an extension of the smooth muscle of the rectum. Then we have the external sphincter as well. Within that sphincter complex, we have the dentate line, which does not occur at one end. It's actually somewhere in the middle of the anal canal itself. Maybe I'll mark the canal out roughly like that. Uh, of course, relative to the dentate line, you have to remember that below the dentate line, uh, this area is sensate. So things like hemorrhoids there uh, definitely need anesthetic before they're treated. Uh, whereas the area above the dentate line is insensate, and that's where you have things like hemorrhoid banding uh, that can be done. Of course, the anal crypts run around here as well. Those can become plugged and infected and lead to uh, anorectal abscesses and fistulas. Of course, those are hidden within the columns of Morgani here. And then when we move up above the anal canal, remember that's about four to five centimeters above the anal verge, then we run into the rectum. And the rectum runs another 11 to 12 centimeters above the anal canal until you get to the sigmoid colon. And then how do you tell the difference between the rectum and the sigmoid colon? That's really about the tenia. If you remember those from anatomy, uh, there's three tenia that run along the colon, uh, kind of between the house strap. And then when you get to the rectum, the tenia actually splays out to once again cover the entire uh, colon, which of course at that time is called the rectum. And that's how you know that transition has happened. So now we're going to look at all this anatomy from a different view, a lateral view, and uh, with a little bit better drawing to just review what we talked about. So this time we're going to work our way from the top down. And so up here you see this tinea right here, so you know you're in the sigmoid colon, and then the tinea goes away, right? There's no tinea down here, so that must be the rectum. Uh, this blue space up here is meant to be the peritoneum. So you can see that especially the anterior rectum is about two thirds covered with peritoneum, the lateral about one third, and then posteriorly, there is no peritoneal covering of the rectum. And then from the sigmoid colon down to the anal canal, remember that's a distance of around 12 centimeters. That contains our entire rectum. And then down here we have our anal canal, which is another four to five centimeters. You can see in here, uh, here is our internal anal sphincter, which is just that extension of the muscular layer of the rectum. Here is our external anal sphincter. Looks like they've represented kind of the hemorrhoidal venous cushions right there as well. And then down here, there's that edge or that verge, that anal verge. And then here we have that five centimeter anal margin of that perianal skin. So starting from the top, sigmoid, 12, roughly 12 centimeters of rectum, four to five centimeters of anal canal, anal verge, anal margin. So these things become really important when we start to think about, for example, resection of, in particular, rectal cancers. So if you've been on colorectal surgery at all, you're familiar with the terms, if I could spell them right, uh, LAR and APR. So LAR stands for low anterior resection, and APR stands for abdomino perineal resection. And the P, perineal, is really the differentiator here because a low anterior resection, that's defined as any resection um, of the rectum or essentially the sigmoid colon that extends past this initial peritoneal reflection 
Uh, but when you do that, you're essentially just taking out the rectum or part of it, but you're able to spare the sphincter complex below. But if you do an APR, an abdominal perineal resection, the per perineal space is resected too. So that's a, a resection of this, the rectum that will include the sphincter complex. Um, and the key there is that the anus, the anal canal, all those structures are gone. So that the patient that gets an APR is stuck with a permanent ostomy, whereas somebody with an LAR, even if they have an ostomy initially to allow their surgery to heal, they can have um, anal sphincter function again eventually and potentially have uh, some non-ostomy years following their surgery. So of course, most people would want an LAR or an APR if they have the choice. So really the key differentiator there is distance for a cancer that's somewhere in the rectum from the sphincter complex. Most people nowadays will say that if you can get, if you can get a two centimeter margin uh, between the cancer and the sphincter complex, you can usually do an LAR, but if it's much closer, um, you're gonna to have to do an APR. Of course, modern, this is always evolving and modern uh, neoadjuvant regimens are helping people uh, push the line here and try to do more uh, sphincter preserving surgeries. And so there's also a lot of cancers of the anal canal uh, where the anatomy has a lot of implications for as well. So to recreate that first picture that we talked about, once again, we have our anal margin, five centimeters there, our anal verge up to our anal canal as defined by our sphincters, internal and external. And then our rectum. So we already talked about rectal cancers. These, it's all about What's your distance from the sphincter complex? Can you do an LAR or are you going to be forced to do an APR? But remember, we also have this squamous tissue down here. So you can have a squamous cell cancer of the anal canal. And of course, this area all around here is also squamous. You can have a squamous cell cancer of the anal margin and these are managed differently. So a squamous cell cancer of the anal canal, that's actually treated with primary uh, chemo radiation, uh, also called the Nigro protocol. Um, whereas a squamous cell cancer of the anal margin can be treated just like squamous cell cancer anywhere else on the bottom, on the body, uh, with techniques such as a wide local excision. And then if this anal canal squamous cell cancer would recur, then you would have to go back and do a salvage APR, which once again, is that resection where you take out this whole, um, sphincter complex and perineal space. And finally, the last type of cancer that's commonly described is an anal canal melanoma. As you can imagine, melanomas are bad actors and usually need pretty uh, significant resection. So a melanoma uh, is typically treated with an APR as well. All right, so that's it for today. Um, hopefully you got a good sense of the important anorectal anatomy and how it applies to a lot of different disorders, especially um, making decisions about the type of resections to do for cancer. Uh, these videos are for educational purposes only. Do not use them to diagnose, diagnose or treat any diseases, and we will see you next time.